So welcome to this uh, webinar in the Iliad webinar series. It's the 10th in the road. And today we are going to cover the topic of ecosystems and biodiversity for digital twins of the ocean. My name is Bente Liljabi. I come from Norway. I'm one of the partners in Iliad. And I'm very happy to greet you here currently from Cape Town and the GEO meeting. But I think this will work fine as it is. Uh, we have two speakers today, but before I introduce uh, you to them, I would like to do some housekeeping uh, today. Uh, please remember to mute yourself uh, when you are not speaking. Uh, and also you can use the chat to ask questions and comments also during the presentations. Uh, today, I think we, because of uh, logistical reasons, we will have questions uh, immediately after the first presentation because Matthias uh, Obst needs to uh, be uh, leaving us a little bit earlier than uh, the whole webinar. So we will give uh, some time for him, um, for you to ask questions and discuss uh, as much as possible with Matthias. Um, the rec this uh, meeting and this webinar is as normal recorded. Uh, and you will also get the slides and everything will be made available for you on the Iliad uh, Academy. And you will also, since you have registered, you will also get links to that material via an email after the fact. Now, um, with that, I think we are ready to be to starting the program. So I will do that by sharing my screen. see and I will do this yes so the agenda in the program today is first um, giving a, a little a bit of background about Iliad, so a short introduction to Iliad. I will do, be doing that. Then we will learn about the digital twin of the ocean bioflow um, case, uh, bioflow biodiversity case studies uh, from Matthias Ops from the University of Gothenburg. And the second speaker or the special presentations will be model data coupling applications with ecological model for and marine environment by uh, Karima Khalil from the Kadi Ayad University in Morocco. And Matthias is in Sweden. Then we will have some discussion time. We will see how this goes. Uh, very excited to have the speakers here with me uh, and with us. Um, and we will start, so just a few words more words about me. I am an active participant in GEO, the Group on Earth Observations dealing with earth observations in whatever form all the all from very uh, interoperability technical issues to more communication and engagement uh, i'm an innovation manager in the iliad um, project iliad digital twins of the ocean and uh, that's why i am here i will just continue continue so with the introduction to the digital twin of the ocean the iliad so it's First, just a quick uh, word on what the digital twin is. The way we see it is uh, a digital twin of the ocean that provides a virtual environment that represents the ocean, that is capable of running uh, complex and predictive management scenarios, but also uh, late with uh, the latest situational and most accurate representation of uh, the ocean and what's in it. Uh, it's an innovative system that we are building that integrates across many different disciplines, many different sensors and models and digital infrastructure. So our approach in Iliad is first of all to acknowledge that the ocean is vast and complex. It consists of uh, geophysical, biological and numerous interactions between these uh, components and also note the human activity. Uh, in, in Europe, we have, sometimes we talk about digital twins of the ocean, and then you have the European twin of the ocean. Um, what we mean, actually, when Europe, on a political level, talk about the, Euro the European twin of the ocean, it's actually an ecosystem of twins and its components 
that you are referring to because we are doing in Europe, there's a lot of investments of uh, digital twins, the components uh, of various sorts. We have uh, um, uh, the editors, infrastructures, you have mo ocean models and so on. So you have many components all in the past, currently, and I'm sure in the future. So Iliad is all about partnership. And that's why we are super happy to have uh, two external speakers with us today. We try to align what we are doing uh, by, with, with the, the rest of the ecosystem by using similar standards, API, and best practices, etc. Interoperability is a key word for us in Iliad. So Iliad in the seashell, it's enabling uh, an ecosystem of interoperable uh, digital twins for the ocean by connecting existing resources and also enhancing it by adding new resources. Uh, particularly, I would make, uh, you'd make note of the fact that we are not only talking about uh, authoritative data or, or resources, but we are uh, through and throughout in integrating also citizen science. Uh, we want to make all, not only the digital twins that we are creating in Iliad uh, accessible uh, and findable for, uh, through a marketplace, but we also uh, are building a system where you can uh, uh, shop, or, shop around uh, for the components that these twins consist of. So this is what we uh, offer in the marketplace. We will also offer if you if you have some model, uh, some yeah components, some data, whatever services uh, that you want to share that you find it relevant for the for a digital twin. The marketplace will be open for you as well. It's uh, as well. It's an open it's an open marketplace. And of course, all of these things that we are doing is contributing to uh, solve societal challenges. So. The digital twins of the ocean can be divided for us. We are talking about thematic twins and also uh, geographically uh, distributed twins. So we have a twin, you can have a fisheries twin. We have fisheries twin, both uh, in the Atlantic, in the Mediterranean, uh, so on different locations. The thematic areas you see here, just uh, I won't go deep into it, but you see the illustration is that we have many different areas, oil spill, uh, water quality, uh, aquaculture, and so on and so forth. Uh, we, uh, the partnership that we are, we are already are, I want to build on is a regional and global dynamic ecosystem. And this that uh, now is an ecosystem of uh, uh, technology and knowledge and not the ecosystem that Karima will be talking about. And we do this by closely working with uh, partners around and it's particularly using uh, standards, APIs, and best practices. I underline this because this is the key. Uh, very quickly, we are 56 partners. The total budget is around 19 million euros. Uh, it's an innovation action, and it lasts for three years, and we are well into the second year. So now I have the pleasure of introducing you to uh, our first speaker, Matthias Obst. Uh, and he is an expert in systematic benthic ecology so, and conservation bio biology. He has many different um, important roles, among others. Um, he is the chair of the Swedish node of the European Marine Biological Research Center and uh, chair also of the Swedish biodiversity data, data infrastructure. Um, we, I will don't uh, go more into detail about you. you. You will, of course, you are a partner in uh, the DTO Bioflow or Digital Twin of the Ocean Bioflow project. And uh, this is what we are going to learn about the project and also some of the modeling. So uh, I'm very happy to have you here, Matthias. Uh, the floor is now yours. I will stop sharing. Thanks so much, Benta. And then I can take over the screen. Let me see if I can share now. Um, okay, so I open my screen. And yeah, Bente, thanks again for giving me the opportunity to talk. And uh, I'm very happy to... Uh, we heard a lot about Iliad already in the proposal phase. So, so we are now eager to get to know the Iliad community. So that's one of our first coin contact points. And I should say that... I'm not on my own. I just checked the 
the participant channel and I see that uh, Christina here is as well. So I'm sharing this work with Christina. We are in the DTO Bioflow project. We are uh, leading this work pack on the use cases and the discussion with uh, Bente, uh, Bente told us that we should focus on the use cases. So there's many other aspects that we will not be able to to cover in, in the 15 minutes, but you're always welcome to ask us more and there may be more chances to talk about this. Um, so uh, Christina probably also stays around longer than me, so you can also grab her later in the discussions. So uh, the DTO Bioflow project and the biodiversity use cases, this is what I will try to introduce you to. Now, if I go to the first slide, that's the overall description, very short description. Um, it's uh, Horizon Mission uh, project and there are very short uh, three uh, overarching goals we are trying to achieve here with the project is we're trying to expand the collection of ocean data sets and this is not any data set is everything that's related to biodiversity that is in a way our task to inject uh, the biology into the digital twin of the ocean so data on species habitats um, ecosystems and the, the pressures in the ecosystems from coming from humans, that's what we're trying to, to mobilize. Uh, and the second one is, of course, the technical task of making these data accessible and findable in the DTO system. And then uh, the third one is to really make them useful. That's kind of easy to say that to us, it sounds logical that all these data should be used, but in practice, it's, it's not useful. Uh, it's, it's not very easy. So these data have to become, uh, may, have to be made uh, kind of useful in a certain context of, uh, of a, around the problem that is uh, happening in the environment. Good. So uh, here are some key facts. So the project goes for three and a half years and we only just started. So this is like a prospective talk, there's a lot of things that I would present that are just discussions that we how we go about. And uh, it's about 10 million euros and 32 partners. There is some significant portion of, of the grant that is actually supposed to pass on to, uh, to institutions who can mobilize data, uh, monitoring networks or uh, partners who would who are external and they would actually they already have data that can be easily uh, connected to the system. So here you see the how the major work package is uh, working. You have like uh, the management work package one and work package six, which is communication. They are kind of off the shelf more or less. Uh, uh, but the core is around these four work packages. Number two is finding new data. And this can this can be different ways of finding new data. There can be existing data. They are not accessible yet, but we're having a lot of focus on existing monitoring networks that are uh, actually uh, these monitoring networks. They, they are just in the process of being established, and they need to be consolidated. And these data streams have to be channeled now into the ecosystem of the digital twins. So that is the focus of work package two. We have uh, work package three, which is then the sustained data flow. So once these data flows are established from the monitoring networks into the databases, then these databases have to be uh, part, become a part of the digital twin. So they have to be uh, following the right standards. They have to be um, uh, connected to the analytical resources and all these things. So work package three really deals with the data providers. And then we have work package four, which is uh, what Christina and I is leading. And that's uh, uh, the actual demonstration use cases. So these DUCs or the ducks we call them, these are demonstrator use cases that make use in a, of these data uh, not only in an ecological meaning, but also in a uh, application meaning, like societal applications, not research for researchers. It is research for societal applications. So we have to get, make it out of the academic bubble here and find external non-academic end users who, who actually find 
and meaningful applications from these data, from these data and monitoring networks. And then work package five is about the technical integration into the DTO infrastructure landscape. So, so these are the, the, uh, the, the four core work packages in a nutshell. Now, this is another representation of what we're doing, how these work packages connect. connect. We have the monitoring networks, you see them in work package two, and they are usually, there's a lot of activity already today, but it's not very concerted and it's not very standardized. So we're trying to force these together into somehow consistent data streams. And then we have for certain types of data, certain data streams, and these data streams then should ramify into various applications. So these societal applications that you see in work package four, they should feed on and become and an should receive an added value by being uh, supported by different data streams. And then of course there is the work package five infrastructure. And uh, one of the major focus uh, points that we want to achieve is, is that we want to have this feedback loop from work package four back to work package two that the monitoring networks, they actually get feedback from the application work package that say like where, when, and how should we optimize and intensify our monitoring to be able to deliver the data that are necessary. So this is one of our first expectations that we have with this project that we get this uh, feedback from the applications uh, because we know that for bio marine biological data, uh, there's a lot of data deficiency out there. So the data streams that exist today, they're still very thin and they're not necessarily consistent. So we, if we just make this connection, this feedback connection that uh, the people are monitoring out there, they are actually informed about what is needed to provide more, uh, better uh, knowledge in the applications. Okay, so, but now let's focus on these demonstrated use cases. And you see these um, seven use cases that we have designed. Uh, they have a topic of focus. Uh, number one is invasive species management. We have adaptive offshore construction and energy harvesting, which is very pressing issue. Um, the plankton diversity, which is something that where we already have a lot of kind of these components in place. Marine spatial planning is one. And then number five is the, um, no, number four is the Murray culture. So it's aquaculture's applications. And then we have number five, which is marine spatial planning and MPA management. Number six is impact fisheries, low impact fisheries. And number seven is uh, to understand carbon sequestration and uh, the ecosystem services behind it. So, these are topics that are widespread and we only started to assemble these different components in each work package to put them together. So I won't have time to talk about all these use cases, but uh, as they are coming together, uh, I should say that it's not probably one use case. It's like kind of a topic where we have, where we can have different use cases in the future. So we don't want to be, be so harsh on like this only one use case and then nothing else in that topic. Uh, but the important criteria for these use cases, you see them here that we're trying to apply, like it should be something that is matured already very fast, uh, very far, so to say. It's not like somebody found like interesting, uh, an interesting method. There has to be some critical uh, activity already in the background. So it's really a question about implementing something rather than trying to uh, establish a method. And the second one is that this element of co-creation is very important. So we need to work with the with the end users a lot. And we want to have this end-to-end -end approach, uh, as I already mentioned. So it has to, be all, has to go all the way, these use cases, from the point of monitoring all the way to the scientific application, uh, the, sorry, the societal application. And um, there has to be an obvious added value. So somehow when these applications arise, they have to be cheaper, better or faster in, in one way that this kind of outcompeting conventional practice. And then uh, we need buy-in from other networks. This can be anything from infrastructure networks, monitoring activities, policy networks, 
uh, we know that this if we build this on our own it will just uh, not stand on itself so we need to have a lot of activity that we taking existing activities and aligning with these that's really important okay so here is an example um uh, that is the background for the invasive species which is a little bit of a low hanging fruit uh, there is a lot of background uh, it's it's really a very strong very clear sharp focus like is the species alien yes if it's alien is it invasive there is a policy framework already established in europe that forces countries to report and monitor and counteract invasive species we have already existing monitoring networks in place so this seems to be uh, uh, the low-hanging fruit here so that's why i'm explaining this one as a first use case so the management scenarios that the DTO could provide this added value is that we're providing these early warning uh, uh, functions and early warning system, maybe even a response system, because the reason why uh, these policy uh, bodies, they are, would like to have an early warning system is because that's the most effective way to counteract invasive species when you detect them at the earliest possible convenience. So a response system, uh, there can be functions there and also a predictive system. And that is mainly for being able to optimize the monitoring. If you know when and where and how they come in, invasive species, you have a better chance of uh, having a successful early warning and response system. So here you see a few examples of the species that have invaded Sweden in the last years. So it's a very realistic case. We have authorities, they're working with this all the time. Uh, and we can always refer and communicate this to these end users. Uh, so one of the most important things that, that we pitched in the last years is to have um, this. Uh, this is based on a lot of empirical trials that we think that genetic monitoring is a very good solution to invasive species because uh, invasive species often overlooked until they're everywhere. And the, po the point when you can sense this or the method that can sense invasive or alien species at the very, at the very earliest time is genetic methods. So we have uh, established already in that work <clears throat> under the European uh, Marine Bio uh, Biological Resource Center, EMBSC, and it's kind of, it's kind of uh, stable. Now we have uh, all these three environments, water, soft sediment, hard bottom is monitored. So these data are channeled into, into different um, systems, uh, data systems, and we have kind of getting this together uh, on the data management side. So here you see an example from uh, last year monitoring effort we did on the Swedish Crest Coast. And we find like incredible amount of alien species, like 36 alien species on, on, on these locations on the West Coast. While this was a comparison with conventional methods and they found two invasive species. And these are the two species you see everywhere. So there's it's nothing unusual. But so we think that uh, genetic monitoring has a lot of value here, and also we all we see that it's in combination with citizen science is very good. So citizen science also plays a major role here. Um, so we are suggesting right now to the authorities uh, that the, an early warning system should uh, monitor with genetic methods, and we have most of these components in place. Um, and here you see uh, some. Uh, scientific results from the first two years of trials. So these are these arm systems like passive sampling systems. Um, they are like hard bottom structures we put in the ocean and we, it's like a small hotel uh, for these marine critters. And you put it on the ocean and you see who's moving in and then you pick it up and you can sequence the data. And you see from uh, 12 countries, 16 observatories, uh, we get about 7,800 species we can capture genetically, uh, for just from two years. Uh, and there's about two and a half thousand that have a diversity, a genetic diversity that you can analyze. And then there's out of these, there's more than 500 which have sufficient genetic diversity to understand the origin and where they come from and, and these kind of things like population genetic information. And then not all of them, we have a linear name to it, only 
but it's still more than 100 species. We can monitor that where we actually have a name to it. And, and that's just from the first two years. So here you see an example, the Lesapian uh, migration, where we have an, a species, it's a hydroid uh, that is very is coming from the North Sea area and it has migrated towards the Mediterranean. And we see it has been breaking through to the Red Sea. Actually, it's a, while the trend is usually opposite, everything moves from the Red Sea into the Mediterranean. We see uh, examples of the opposite direction uh, of travel. So, so this is very valuable and uh, we will explore this. All the analytical resources for analyzing this are actually, actually already there. They have been developed by the LifeWatch infrastructure and we have the workflows there. So this is almost ready to be just moved into the ecosystem of the DTO. And here you see another scientific uh, uh, analysis of like all these different species that we find that are alien. And alien species uh, can be distinguished in three types, the cryptogenic ones, which means you don't know where they come from. There's so few knowledge on this species that it could have been living here already for a hundred years uh, or have always been living here, but you have never observed it enough to be able to say where it comes from. So this is cryptogenetic. And then you have the hitchhikers. These are the ones that come from far away. And then you have the range expanders, which are the ones they are in the area, but they're moving slowly. And you see that when you're taking these uh, species across a gradient of human influence, which goes from ports to marinas, to kind of neutral areas where there's no human activity all the way to protected areas, then you have a very strong signal only in hitchhikers. That means the hitchhikers, they are the one traveling, especially through uh, the, the, the shipping industry and you have to find and you have to counteract them in the port areas. So this is valuable information for the authorities to say where to, where to monitor and how and where to counteract. And finally, there is this predictive system where we have already developed distrib species distribution models for uh, invasive species to kind of identify the hotspots for Northern Europe. And uh, it's, it's interesting to see that we did this two years ago and we found these hotspots on the Northern part of the Swedish West Coast, you see it here. And actually that's where we have made in the last 12 months, three new encounters of new species. So these models are actually now um, confirmed by real new observations of, of arrivals of new species. And uh, we have authorities, they're really starting to use this system now. They trying to get this information to counteract, to predict. And, and that's what we, we wanna get. So that is uh, the case. And, and just to mention that we have databases in place. So the monitor, genetic monitoring data, they go all the way to GBIF and are available there. And we have the analytical workflows in place provided by LifeWatch to analyze these one. You see these here. Okay, so I think I already talked way too long. It's like more than 15 minutes, so I can stop it here. I just want to mention first one thing that there was this uh, tender out just a month ago from the Iliad project on non indigenous species. And whoever got that tender, we would really like to talk to these people because it looked like very much what we do, but in the Northern Europe. And this one was for the port of Valencia. So I think we can stop it here unless, yes, I think so. That's That's a good way to break it. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Matthias. And actually, I can tell you immediately that we have somebody from Sparak uh, among us. At least they, Isam was here. I saw that. Um, I know you have to run, uh, Matthias. So I see that there, there's at least one uh, interesting question I think you will be happy to uh, to see also. So I see Frank. Frank, Emilie, uh, can you... Uh, perhaps uh, unmute yourself and uh, ask the question directly if you are in the position to do that. I think that would be great. Yeah, hi, Frank. Hi, how are you doing? Well, thank you for the opportunity. I I didn't really pose a question. I was just telling people that um, we have these several different communities of practice. One is the Ocean Best Practices System, and I see Pauline Simpson is here. You probably know about OBPS. Also, the Marine Biodiversity Observation Network, and Matthias is very familiar with with MBON. 
And we have this process of the ocean decade that is in process. We have Marine Life 2030, which is one of the programs of the ocean decade. And there's a visioning pro process, a vision 2030 process that leads up to the Ocean Decade Conference in Barcelona in April next year. And there, there's groups, 10 groups, writing vision papers uh, that, that are looking for refining how can we manage marine life issues, uh, biodiversity, re restoration of habitats, and so on. Uh, and so I think that these digital twins play a big role. One of the things that we would like to advance our goals and metrics on how the decade is working for, for these goals that we have traced uh, by 2030. And, and if there's anything that you want to contribute or this group wants to contribute on how you define these goals, metrics, and moving toward 2030 and beyond, uh, please let me know. Yes, uh, I, I thought it, it's sort of a question, so do you have any ideas, uh, Frank? That's how I read you. <laughs> and it was nice to get uh, your uh, background for asking that question. So, Matthias, do you have any thoughts around it? Uh, yes, we are all in uh, like these different, any of these different networks that we are compiling ourselves. They have their uh, contacts to uh, global initiatives, like uh, Frank said we are very well connected to the americans so so we have a very good connection we for example to the, uh, the we have in the indian ocean um there is a project uh, where we're trying to link to um so so there, there is links here and there it's not systematic but everyone starts with their own every project every network starts with their own connections and we i think that's a very good point that this already comes up now we have to think beyond beyond the end of our project and beyond the ocean decade, because this is going to take more time. It, we will have something maybe up and running like flaky, but, but then who is going to support it in the long run? And that is the sustainability thinking. We have to we have to think about it. So we have to create a almost like a business model. So who's going to pay? We cannot, we, we, we know that, that the European Commission will support us, yeah, but maybe we need somebody else to pay in the long run. And this would be these the users of these societal applications. And uh, so it's very important. It may take a little longer time to design these and do the technical work, but uh, let's make it work so they can actually see some added value with it, these societal end users. And then we have a good we have a good chance, I think. And and uh, before I run away, I can give the word to Christos, who is also here. He is the CEO of LifeWatch, and and he and Christina they they know all about it, so okay. they do. <laughs> so they can continue the discussion. They can Christos. exactly. I was yes. So yeah, you want to comment, and then I I keep Corey, uh, who also wants to ask a, a question. Uh, but Christos, are you? Uh, yeah. You want to wait for Kipori or you want to uh, comment right away now? Yeah, right away if possible. Yeah. Uh, yes, just yes, to yes. Continue, just to continue what Matthias was uh, talking about. And this is about the sustainability. This is uh, actually um, a two-folded uh, concept here. Uh, on one side, we have the concept of the DTO, uh, which is something that perpetually monitors and delivers um, results uh, to the user uh, because otherwise uh, there's no need, you know, for uh, DTOs uh, uh, for digital twins, and uh, and therefore that's uh, that's uh, uh, somehow an inherent uh, attribute of uh, the digital twin, and therefore desirable. And on the other side is uh, the sustainability part uh, of uh, the. Um, the, the sustainability implementation part, uh, which uh, which has you know probably uh, many players, um, uh, one of the I think that one of the key players are the research infrastructures because um, in their portfolio they have you know a function which is to act as incubation chambers. That means uh, to be up to the point uh, to receive and also or federate and also um, maintain, upgrade, update the research products, I any research product, not, on, not only, you know, data or 
analytical services or networks, et cetera, et cetera, any product, including publications, and have them ready for any consortium or any network uh, to, to take them up uh, onwards to the next project, et cetera, et cetera. And also for the research community and any other community to use them. So that, that would be, you know, my, uh, my chip here. Yeah, thank you, Christos. Now, uh, keep calling. Uh, it's your turn. <laughs> thank you for your patience. Okay, thank you, uh, Penta. Thank you, uh, Christos and Matthias uh, for, for the excellent presentation. Um, I'm a blue carbon ecologist and um, with regards to DTOs, I've been looking at it where most of it has been on um, various parameters, uh, but now I'm seeing it is working on the ecosystems and uh, biodiversity, which is very critical. So I, I, I also, uh, I, I work for a research institution in Kenya and also uh, affiliated to the UNEP with Global Environment Monitoring for the Ocean, which is uh, as interacted with Iliad in a number of cases. So um, my, my, ish, my question was, uh, on do, although it has been answered partly, is uh, how now this, like in the areas like the tropical areas, like in our area, Western Indian Ocean, uh, we have a lot of uh, data, a lot of monitoring, a lot of observation, particularly with regard to coral reefs, uh, mangroves, seagrasses. So I was uh, wondering how this now can, uh, because this is a new area where uh, the DTOs will help in interpretation. Most of the problems we have been having is a uh, uptake of the data by the society because most of it is more or less scientific. But I think this is an opportunity. So my 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 my, my case was any prospects of now reaching out to other areas like uh, in this case the Western Indian Ocean where we have a lot of data, but it would be like low flying low lying fruits uh, to integrate them into the uh, digital twin. Uh, thank you. Thank you. That's a very interesting question. Uh, question, and we are talking about one ocean all the time. So, uh, but I don't. This question is, I think, perhaps Christos or Christina could answer on behalf of uh, the group of Matthias. He offered you. Christos. <laughs> yeah. Um, maybe we can uh, we can have you know a more uh, let's say direct. Uh, question because uh, it, it was somehow you know developed uh, uh, through um, a statement and um, yeah. uh, uh, maybe if our colleague you know can make uh, very clear what is the part of uh, of the statement that uh, he needs you know to be answered uh, yes. yes please yes so so uh, then uh, keep Corey um... You can, because uh, Christina and Christos, you, you have time to stay on for, to also listen to Karimar, I hope. I guess we yes. could comment on this uh, with reference to the current DITO event that we have in uh, okay. Xiamen in China this week. Because yeah. uh, talking about digital twins of the ocean, uh, we have, of course, this context of the European digital twin of the ocean, but we also have the UN Ocean Decade uh, program on the international digital twins of the ocean. And the summit that's going on starting tomorrow until Sunday in Chiameng will discuss the international perspective of this. And of course, the DTO Bioflow and, and other projects also on biodiversity are represented. So the objective is to make this internationally. Of course, there's funding issues on that, but the DTO is non-funded, but uh, goes across uh, funded projects. So it certainly is um, a perspective that will be included in DTO and be discussed later this week. Absolutely. So thank you, Arne, for, for uh, saying that. And then you can come back to, we, uh, hopefully we will have continued the, 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 this discussion after Karima has introduced us to ecosystems. I will first introduce Karima. Uh, so I will share my screen again. And then we can uh, maybe continue the discussion after uh, Karina's, uh, Karima's pres presentation.
So, uh, Karima Khalil, uh, she is a professor at the um, Kadi Ayad University, Higher School of Technology in Asauria, uh, Morocco. She's also a vice director of the Laboratory Applied Sciences on Environmental and Sustainable Development. She has a background both from physics and from environment. And uh, she's an active author, professor, and, um, and, and she's also a member of a thematic expert group of global marine spatial planning uh, under UNESCO. And she is a secretary of the African chapter of International Society of Ecological Modeling. So Karima, I'm delighted to have you here. Uh, with us. Uh, she was also, by the way, the uh, lecturer in the very successful uh, Iliad summer school uh, earlier this year. So Karima, the floor is yours. You are able to share your screen, I hope. Yes, yes. Looks like you're good to go. Um, we almost don't hear you. If you're speaking, we don't hear you. you hear me? Do you hear me? Yes, yes, now we hear you. Yes. Okay. Sorry. So, uh, Thanks, Ben, for this invitation and for presentation. Happy to be here in this uh, presentation. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening for others. Uh, today, I present you our work on model data coupling using application with ecological models of marine ecosystems. So, as you know, when when we talk about marine ecosystem they are very interconnected when we define an ecosystem physically distinct area containing a community of interacting organisms these marine organisms form relationships with one another and share space and resources so a little impact on a single species in an ecosystem can affect many other species in the same ecosystem. That's why it is important to manage these natural resources in order to reflect these interconnectedness of ecosystems and their components. One way to facilitate that is uh, to do modeling. So when, when you want to model marine ecosystem, for example, when we work on pelagic area, we need to describe all processes, all uh, processes, all state variables in this area and the connection with the space variables we play. So, Area has to be connected also with seasonal area and add more state variables and the more processes and more connections. Uh, Karima, did you shift position because suddenly your sound was uh, became a little bit uh, worse? Okay, for that I didn't. Uh, I think we lost your sound, Karima. Karima? Now it's okay? Yes, now we hear you again. Good. Okay. So this marine ecosystem 
are also connected with other ecosystems. As atmosphere, for example, there are many expenses to marine ecosystems and atmosphere. So we have to learn about processes and uh, other state variables. These marine ecosystems are also connected with land or continents by rivers and estuaries. So, more we add process, more we add state, more we add processes, more we have state variables and complexity of model. That's why ecological models in marine systems are very complex with their mathematical representation, representing costs of learning within marine ecosystems. These processes can be biological, physical, and also chemical. These ecological models should have many objectives. For example, to ask the health of marine ecosystems, it can identify vulnerable species and credit Due to change. Can Karima, also... Karima, are, yes. are you using are you using headset? Because the, the sound is getting uh, okay. uh, very difficult to understand what you are saying. We ah. hear you breaking. Up. Now it's okay. Yes, it's better. Maybe you have to speak very directly into yes. where the microphone is. Yes. Okay, so, yeah, okay, I will try. For these models, ecological models, they can do anything like assess the health of marine ecosystems, identify vulnerable species and predict shifts due to climate change, inform social education practice by predicting stock bandwidth, and also assessing impact of different management scenarios. This model can also simulate how marine ecosystems respond to changes in temperature, sea level rise, and ocean acidification. But for this, it is important to include collaborative efforts among scientists. <laughs> Karima, I'm so sorry. Uh, <laughs> The sound is not uh, getting through. So, unfortunately, I don't know if uh, maybe uh, we can ask um, we can ask uh, Katya. Are you there? Yeah. To share the the presentation, so we so we try with without you sharing the presentation and you just say next next uh, and see if that helps, uh, Karima. I don't think. Uh problem with the uh, sharing uh, screen thank you it's not taking up to too much bandwidth yes i think this is the uh, maybe connection or audio now it's better it goes oh, no. now you will say it it sounds like you are speaking direct when you are able to speak very directly into the microphone we hear it clearly okay. but then when you go on you it's Maybe you keep a more distant, I don't know. But okay, so I, I will continue like that. Yes. Uh, okay. Hopefully it will work. So I say that these ecological models in marine ecosystems are very complex. They contain mathematical representation of the processes occurring within this marine ecosystem. These processes can be biological, physical, and chemical. These models are used for many objectives. For example, to assess the health of marine ecosystems, to identify vulnerable species and predict shifts due to climate change. Also, to, inform us, uh, to, to give us information about sustainable fishing practices by predicting fish stock dynamics and to assess the impacts of different management scenarios. It can also simulate how marine ecosystems may respond to changes in temperature, sea level rise, and ocean acidification. You, do you hear me better now?
Yeah, yes. this was better. So I'll just okay, continue. Okay, thank you. So I continue. That's why the, we need collaborative effort among scientists, policymakers, and stakeholders to ensure that these models are used effectively for conservation and sustainable management of marine ecosystems. Now I will show you some uh, application of these ecological models on marine ecosystems. Uh, I will start with the pelagic area with NPZD modeling. This model N, N for nutrients, P for phytoplankton, Z for zooplankton, and D detritus. It contains uh, many state variables of nutrients as silica, nutrients, phosphorus with different forms. These state variables are connected with not other state variables for phytoplankton as diatoms, phalagellates, and also zooplankton for microzooplankton and mesozooplankton. And the links between all these state variables are the processes. When we apply the this uh, model on Agadir, uh, this is uh, located on the Moroccan Atlantic uh, Ocean. Uh, we obtain this uh, result uh, for <clears throat> spatial variation for phytoplankton, diatom and flagellate, and also zooplankton. We obtain also uh, variation of nutrients as ammonia here, nitrates, phosphorus, and silica. Now, I move to application in the benthic area with diagenetic model. This model based on control reaction equation is, and this model describes the biochemical processes and reactions in, inside the marine sediment. When we try to apply this model on some station for in study seats in France, here we, you, are, you have some model output. You can see that the model, we, we have good fitting between model in lines and the field data uh, in circles for all components, oxygen, nitrate, sulfate, dissolved in organic carbon, ammonium, and others. Uh, for more details, I put here some references of uh, the, the publication of this work. And the last application I show you for ecosystem modeling using ECOPAT. This is a simple uh, model uh, based on two equations, one for production and the other for consumption with mass balance equation. And uh, we applied on Mogador Marine Protected Area uh, located on the Atlantic, uh, Moroccan Atlantic Ocean. Uh, this is uh, one of the model outputs flow diagram. Uh, a, of the food web of this MPA, Marine Protected Area Mogador. It, here you have presentation of uh, different functional groups in this area and uh, according to different trophic levels. And the size of circle is proportional to the biomass of each functional group. So to summarize, these ecological models used uh, for benthic, pelagic, and dynamic populations are very useful to stimulate, to understand, and predict the function of marine ecosystems. We can note that it is interdisciplinary combining biology, mathematics, uh, physics, biochemistry, and socioeconomic also. 
And at each step of this modeling, we need and we use data for parameterization, for input, for initial in, uh, input parameters. We use data for calibration and validation with output models. And, and at the same, same time, we produce data. So to understand this functioning of the complex ecosystem, we need to study processes at small scale. That's what we do. And uh, as a perspective, we aim to couple these different models, benthic, pelagic, and dynamic populations, uh, knowing that it's very difficult to do that uh, due to the different uh, space and time scale. Thank you for your attention and sorry for the audience. Thank you, thank you, Karima. So, for uh, I I don't know what uh, it happened, but uh, no, it's uh, I think we can uh, see in the edit we can maybe clean up a little bit, and I hope that people uh, yeah. all the same manage to to get the essence of what you were saying throughout. Uh, it was varying sound. Um, do we have any questions, uh, comments for Karima? Um, maybe I have one uh, for you then, uh, Christina slash Christos, uh, with respect to, you know, the relationship between the biodiversity here and the ecosystem modeling, you know, the biological components, obviously, we saw the last slide here, definitely, that there is, they are linked. So how do you see this ecosystem modeling compared to what you are doing on, on biodiversity, I, I guess it will vary from the different showcases that Matthias showed us. Yes, sure. Uh, for what uh, Matthias showed you before, uh, there is a link because uh, when you see the, the last part of my application was about dynamic population. So yeah. we, we work on fisheries in different areas to know if uh, the area is uh, exploited or over exploited, for example, by overfishing. And we are interested also to see the connection between uh, functional, yeah, between the functional group of between species. That's why we use this uh, for that. And so this is linked with biodiversity to Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, uh, thank you, Karima. Uh, Christos? I, I think that they, uh, they are completely interlinked, uh, the, the two approaches. Um, the approach that Matthias uh, uh, presented uh, with, the, with the VRE uh, is trying actually to compare patterns and processes uh, from the data that we have now and uh, the models uh, can give us, you know, um, the, the values of some variables very important for us uh, in order uh, to have the picture uh, of those patterns in the future, of those processes in the future, and therefore to compare them. And uh, that's very important. And um, I, I think that this interplay uh, between, the different, uh, between the different approaches uh, should be somehow, you know, uh, galvanized more in in the future, and we should find you know the opportunity to channel them both into the sustainability part uh, of uh, the uh, of the digital twins. Yes, it's. Uh, I think for me, uh, just having this discussion here between what you so the biological or the biodiversity community. And the ecosystem models, uh, and and the and the the framework we are talking about is the digital twin. And as you said, Chris, I mean, there's a necess there's a yeah a one goal, one aim is to have uh, more to play with models for the future, right? So so combining this, all of this different, 
this diff complex system that the uh, the ocean is with the different components how do you actually make that meaningful uh, to this this prediction in a meaningful way this is where i see that the 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 concept of a digital twin can be very useful a concept that we haven't really exploited earlier i don't know if you anybody here would like to to share their thoughts on on that uh, we are all here for the digital twins yeah just uh, ben, to add something when we work on uh, this type of model where we have only biology we and we try to put some parameters of for example the environment parameters like quality uh, water quality or or like other other parameters of the, the, the area, uh, we have we can constrain more our modeling. That's why it's interesting to combine between biology, biodiversity, and environmental factors, for example. Because really, uh, when we do that, we control more our modeling, and we can have more confidence to this modeling. That's what can I so it's interesting to do biology only or for example by uh, geochemistry only, but the objective is to connect it even for small scale, but it gives us more information. I understand. Uh, is that uh, uh, an old hand or a new hand, Christoph? <laughs> No, that's a new one. I would like to yeah, yeah, add yes. something yeah. and uh, actually to complement what uh, Karima said, you know, just now. Um, indeed, uh, we need, you know, to connect uh, different parts or different components of the system. The ocean is a huge system with many components, some of which we don't have even the slightest clue yet. Uh, and in biology, at least, this is what we we call it, you know, the dark matter of of yeah. biology, you know, because uh, every every week they're screening genetic material and they come up, you know, with thousands uh, of new things for which we have no idea uh, what is their their position and their function in the in the system in the ocean ecosystem. Uh, that's why they they come up, you know, with a coupled uh, models. And they try, you know, to uh, somehow take uh, the oceanographic slash atmospheric models and uh, and their outputs. They're used they're used in the biological or biogeochemical models as uh, external forcing. And uh, uh, then uh, this kicks out, you know, all of the execution of uh, of the biogeochemical model. And this is fantastic. What is um, a little bit weird uh, for um, applying the concept of uh, uh, of a digital twin in, in biological systems is that the digital twin uh, has been coined, you know, in order to um, help uh, a pipeline to, of production, you know, to, to reproduce it, you know, in silica and therefore try to find the risks, uh, try to find, you know, uh, how to fix the risks or uh, the damages, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, if you have a production line, you know, in a plant, that's easy. Because once you, uh, you locate, once you, once you spot where the problem is in silica, then you have, you know, the opportunity to go down to the machinery and say, all right, uh, we have to replace this component and we have to twist this component into something like this. And that's that. And, and, and it is working now. But when we talk about, you know, such complex systems, like, uh, you know, the ocean ecosystem, you don't have any chance uh, to go there. So what we do actually is that we are implementing or we, we're using and developing uh, uh, things in order to implement the concept of uh, digital twin. But then again, the only, uh, let's say, um, information that uh, we may use is the information that is coming out of... Uh, of uh, the model and try to find out that um, what if uh, scenarios can can be produced and how we can minimize you know the risk for example what if you know the ph of uh, of the sea goes you know uh, up by by one uh, unit for example what would be you know the the effect on on the on the fish production in this lagoon 
etc etc so that's that's my point here yeah yeah indeed uh thank you for that uh do i see i i i have to admit that my eyes are the light is a little bit challenging for me so apologies for that do i see any other are there any on the comments here please do raise your hand because that's easier for me to see rather than your your scripture yes hi tom hey hi. everybody hey. Uh, thank you karima uh, it's very interesting uh, models my question is where um, your uh, models meet in the bathymetry um, underwater uh, topography the complex in a seabed. Like all the models are talking about only about the water. Uh, and uh, we can't uh, disconnect between the, the, the sea floor and um, the water itself. Okay, so, uh, hello, Hayton. Uh, for if I understand your question, what about bathymetry? Yes. How we can do it? So what I present here, the first part was about pelagic zone uh, when applied in Agadir. For this, we use biogeochemical model. The state variables were was uh, like phytoplankton, zooplankton, nutrients. Do you hear me? Yes, yes. And nutrients. And it is not coupled with physical part mm. or with hydrodynamic. We have another work with, we have only hydronomic work on the same area. And the okay. challenge is to couple the hydronomic part with this biogeochemical model. Okay. This is the, the idea. I, okay. <laughs> and, um, actually, I'm working uh, in, in between the structural connectivity and the functional connectivity together. So it's um, it's a, a different approach from yours, um, but I would like to um, like discuss it uh, later if it's possible. Thank you. With pleasure, Hayton. You are in which uh, institute? University of Haifa. Okay. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Nice to meet you. Excellent. Um, I was going to uh, yes. So now you are talking about the ecosystems and the chemical. The chemical composition, first and foremost, right, Karima, not the geophysical, like currents and uh, yes, or maybe this, is, yes. This is I I didn't present this part. This is about hydrodynamic models yes. in the same uh, area we did it in another publication. Right, because that also needs to be, uh, you know, that also is part of this complex system, as as and as uh, Haithamsa said. Uh, it's also the you know the constraints <laughs> of the hydrodynamics. It's more <laughs> complex. Should we yes. touch the physical part, and yeah. the, the the challenge is how to combine these physical parts with yeah. other biochemical parts. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So uh, I I can I can say I mean there are so many parameters that are that you have not that you don't know. Uh, it was said, uh, I can just uh, make the analogy to, uh, to to when to my background where it, that was the theoretical astrophysics. And we were modeling stars. You can imagine that was even more challenging in terms of uh, lack of data, <laughs> uh, even less data about, you know, how do you model how the star is uh, functioning, you know, the mechanism, the, the dynamics, etc. And what we did was uh, to keep some of the you pretended that you knew and I guess this is exactly the same thing that you can do to create uh, constraints of your modeling as well that you pretend that you know some of the parameters is this correct yes but to sure uh, because when we do this modeling sometimes we don't have all data mm. so we can see some uh, papers to have uh, parameters even it's not coherent to the same area and sometimes we just estimate or put uh, some values but at the end we try to fit model 
output model with uh, field data. Mm. See if uh, and we we what we do is to fit model with uh, with the output with field data, and we try to have the best fitting. And when we do that, we have to change some parameters. And what we change this unknown parameter. Exactly. This and this Yeah. And this is I think the the digital twin technology and concept enable us to play more with this uh, parameters, you know, to, to see how it fits reality because this is the privilege that we after all we have on earth that we have some data that represent reality that we know is is real so yeah anyways i'm just you know uh, thinking of how the digital twin on the on the technicals on the technical uh, capacity that we are developing on the ict part for instance is is helping us to understand this complex system better maybe arne jorgen i see you are still here so maybe you have something to add on the technological part here in this, you know, this biodiversity ecosystem modeling that needs to be somehow uh, to to have the best possible understanding of reality, that it will be very good to have them combined somehow. Have you had some thoughts on that, Arne Jürgen? Yes, this is, of course, the promise of, of digital twins that they will combine uh, real-time data with a, with a certain frequency. I mean, in our case, it doesn't have to be seconds or minutes or days or even weeks. It can be months. But there is some synchronization between observations in reality and uh, data that we can use then to calibrate our models so they can be more closely connected. And that goes for all kind of data. So uh, now we are focusing on, on biodiversity that will of course be combined with the classical metocean data, uh, but we can also add on other data coming from uh, marine traffic, uh, from pollution, socioeconomic data, all kind of data that can impact uh, the ecosystem. Uh, the idea is to be able to combine data from many different sources and make that available through uh, international infrastructures of, of data collection and data aggregation. Uh, of course, this will take time, so it's, uh, it's a step towards a journey. We have the oceans decade uh, towards 2030, but it will continue beyond that. But we see engagement and interest now all over the world as being... Uh, highlighted by the DITO Symposium Summit in, in Xiamen in China now this week, um, that uh, all countries around the world see uh, an opportunity to contribute to this. And we are getting now the, the IT technology combining satellite data with uh, sensor data and also more inexpensive data, citizen science data. So, uh, so it's an interesting journey we are in all together. Uh, combining uh, with scientists from a number of, of disciplines that can combine their models. So uh, we are in the beginning of a very interesting journey, I think. Yeah. Exactly. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Haitam, is that a new hand or an old hand? You're first on my list. Sorry, it's old hand. It's an old hand. Okay, then I welcome uh, Hussein. Nice to see you again, Hussein. The floor is yours. Hi, in, uh, I'm very happy to join you. Uh, uh, so uh, my uh, my uh, question is, for example, in uh, some MPEs, we might have uh, enough data since there is uh, st uh, always uh, studies of uh, uh, mapping, for example, of uh, seagull grass mapping. Uh, we are uh, dealing with uh, anthropogenic uh, factors, etc. So we have um, in some MPs, we can have uh, data. So in terms of uh, of uh, monitoring and uh, the uh, management of the MPE, so it would be very good to have uh, 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 not on real time uh, uh, the, the data data or uh, um, real-time model, but it's still interesting to 
to to have uh, some tools to, for example for uh, the uh, evolution of seagrass mapping uh, next to the the activities like uh, like uh, trawling or the reserve effects coming from no go zone or no take zone so this might be very good tool to uh, to modelize and uh, to have some uh, uh, kind of tools that can serve for uh, managers. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Hussein. Um, do we have more? I don't see any more in the chat. Do we have uh, some more comments or, or questions? I hope you were inspired by these uh, presentations. I thought they were excellent, both of them. And thank you, uh, Matthias. Uh, you will hear this recording. <laughs> and thank you so much, Karima. Uh, and thank you Not all. Bad. I'm sorry for the noise. We will see what we can fix. Most of it was OK, uh, Karima. So um, thank you again. Uh, the next webinar will be in uh, December. And uh, just follow us, uh, Digital Twin of the Ocean, uh, on, in social media. Look us up in, on the web page, ocean uh, underscore uh, twin uh, dot EU. And uh, we hope to see you again. And definitely we will continue to engage with uh, both of your communities, uh, the biodiversity community and the Digital Twin of the Ocean Bioflow. And also with you, Karima, I see this is only a starting point for our engagement uh, on digital twins and ecosystems. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye bye. bye. bye.